I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. I'm just going to read seven verses, and then I want to share a few thoughts with you tonight under this wonderful presence of God that's here. A certain woman, Genesis, I mean, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets carried, cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel that he that are. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay your debt, and you and your son shall live on the rest. Somebody say amen. Amen. I want to talk tonight for a few moments about the catalyst to destiny. The catalyst to destiny. Often we don't realize that it is in the circumstances of crisis that comes the catalyst for us to move into the miraculous of God. And so often we look at the circumstances of life to come our way in a realm of desperation, in a realm of suffering, in a realm of questioning of, oh God, why? Oh God, why? Oh God, why? But God is wanting us to approach him in the crisis. This lady had a crisis, okay? She lost her husband. This, they did not have welfare back then. We're not going to have welfare much well, longer if it keeps going the way it is, but they didn't have Social Security. There was no safety net. And that back then, the men were the breadwinners. So she had no way and no source of getting income. They had a debt problem, which they probably shouldn't have had. And back then, there was no filing bankruptcy. Back then, the way you paid your debt, if you could not pay for it, is your children got sold. You either sold yourself or your children. And they had to work off the debt. And often it was so great that they just spent the rest of their life in slavery. Now, I don't know if you could put yourself in that circumstance, but this lady's got a serious circumstance going on in her life. She's lost her husband, and she's on the verge of losing herself her family, her children, that which is most spoken and lose it to a creditor. They're going to become a slave. I mean, can you get that picture in your mind? They're going to become slaves. This is not good work. Y'all with me on that? And so she cried out to the man of God. Now, I like the fact that she cried out and she was looking for somebody that had an anointing. Too often we cry out. It's, it's amazes me. I, even Christian people, they get on the phone, they cry out to a, a, a psychic network. Huh? We, they cry out to the government. Boy, it's quiet now. Come on, even we cry out to the medical profession. Nothing wrong with, with the medical profession, but we cry out to so many things. But God is sitting there saying, no, you need to, you, we, we need to find somebody that's got something. And she cried out to the man of God. Now, I know there's a day going on today right now where people are like, well, you don't want to, you know, don't put so much stock on a man of God. Let me tell you something. There are anointed people on the planet. I promise you, you wouldn't be saying that if the Apostle Paul was raised from the dead and suddenly stood right here and said, I'm going to have a healing line. I don't think people would be wondering, well, I just don't want to look to a man. Come on, somebody. Amen. God anoints people for divine purposes. Now, we're not talking about making superstars, and we're not talking about people lapping themselves with all kinds of luxury, but God anoints people for, circum- for supernatural circumstances. Elijah was a man of God, proven to be a man of God, and she went to the man of God and said, hey, she cried out, help me, I'm about to lose everything. Yeah. 
And I love what Elijah said by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray that God speaks to us a little bit today on this. Let's go to verse 3. So Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? What shall I do for you? Everybody write this down. Number one, I need to be specific. I need to be specific. So often we're going around in our circumstances and our troubles and our, our, the things in our life that are going wrong. And we're just saying, oh, help, oh, help, oh, I just wish I had some help. But God is wanting us to begin to exercise our faith and ask for something specific. What do you want? Jesus did the same thing. Come on, remember when the lepers came up to him? Lord, have mercy on us. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Come on, same thing with the man at the gate, beautiful. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I can tell you're crippled. But stop waiting for me to initiate the, uh, the, the contact and initiate the thing. Stop, oh, if God loved me, he would just, he knows my needs, he would just come meet it. Yes, he could, but he wants you to open your mouth and ask for something specific. Amen. Come on, the Bible says you have not because you, you have not because you ask not. And so he says, what do you want me to do for you? Tell me. Open your mouth and tell me what you want me to do. I could see, remember so many times in my life where God has challenged me in that area to, to talk to him, then to be specific. What do you want? What do you want? I had a dream just the other day, very powerful prophetic dream. And in the dream, Dr. Moore Cirillo appeared to me gave me a a commission from God to do something, and it was a prophetic dream. This was a dream from the Lord. But he turned to me, and he said, what do you want? And he said, money is not going to be an option or a problem. Hello. And he was saying to me, well, let me bring you into the stream, okay? He was saying to me, he was giving me the commission of where to go, and he said, what do you want? And I was sitting there going to him, tell me how much I got. What's my budget? What is my budget? Because he turned to me, he says, he says, money is not going to be an issue. And he kind of winked at me, gave me a little wink. Up. I got you covered. Now the man has access to some resources. Come on, if Bill Gates walked up to you and said, hey, hey, what's your vision? I got you covered financially. So he turned to me and said, what do you want? Well, my knee-jerk reaction is to sit there and say, how much do I got? Because if you tell me how much my budget is, then I'll figure out a really good plan. Come on, amen? And I said, how much do I got? He wouldn't tell me. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, how much do I got? He said, tell me what you want to do. I said, how much do I got? Back and forth in the dream, this kept coming back and forth to me. How much you, and, I, and, 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 and it was kind of frustrating, that part of the dream. And I woke up and, and God spoke to me and many other things in the dream. And it was just, it was only just two days ago that all of a sudden it began to hit me. Pastor Al brought it up to me and it started to hit me. And I said, wait a minute, God is trying to deal with a thinking in my mind. I'm still putting a limitation. I knew that it wasn't more surreal. I knew he was representative of the Lord speaking to me. And God was saying, what do you want? And I was saying, how much do I got? How much is my budget, Lord? What is my lid on what I have? And that's not what God is asking you. He's not wanting you to come to him with an expectation of a limitation. Come on. He's wanting you to come and say, what do you want? Woo, come on, is somebody hearing me? Come on, what do you want? No, we're not talking about squandering it on your own selfish lust. That's, that's, that's violating another scripture. But what is it do you want? Not just money for yourself. Let's get off just ourselves. Not just money for yourself and not even just health. What do you want? Come on, I was in the gym crying out to God today. The Spirit of God was on me. And I'm crying out to God, oh God, increase the anointing because I want to see drug addicts delivered and I want to see to break the back of addiction in this nation. God, increase the anointing. What do I want? I want an authority and anointing that we can walk into a city and break the back of the enemy in a moment. You say, oh, you're dreaming too big. That No, I'm not. Huh? What do you want? 
God is looking for a people that are going to get in to cry out and lay a hold of the horns of the altar and say, oh God, do something in me so I can change the world around me. Oh God, send revival. What do you want? This woman had to answer that question and we have got to answer the question but often you will not get there until you're at the moment of crisis until you're at the moment of losing everything when it seems like the enemy has come in and is going to strip everything away from you that's the moment that God not only wants to provide you for your needs but he wants to release something of a breakthrough yes. somebody said the devil's a liar, devil's a liar. Say, turn to your neighbor and say what do you want What do you want? Huh? Can you allow your faith to stretch that far? Shh. Can you get the limitations off the, off the budget? Shh. Oh, Lord. So often we pray this way. It's really a poverty spirit. Oh, God, all I need is a little roof over my head. Little food in my stomach. Little clothes on my back and I'll be all right. Well, okay, that's all right. If you're selfish. God told you to clothe the naked. How can you clothe the naked if you only got enough clothes for yourself? God told you to feed the hungry. How can you feed the hungry when you barely got enough food for yourself? He said, show hospitality to strangers. How can you do that when you got 12 people living in a one-bedroom apartment? Come on, somebody, Amen. amen. We're not talking about, again, squandering ourselves on our own selfish lust. Everything must be done in modesty and moderation. But God is looking for a people that are going to take the limits off of him and begin to ask for something great because there's a lot of hurting people out there. There's a lot of desperate people out there, and he needs to get something to his people so he can get it through his people to touch the needy and the lost and the hurting and the wounded. So what is it that you really want? Right. Hallelujah. <sighs> Whew. We've got to break that poverty spirit of that continual wall of the limitation. We serve a God who said that he would give unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. He said, he said that he would provide for us according to his riches in glory. And he's God and everything he opens his mouth and speaks, he creates what's not already there. Therefore, there is no limitation. What do you want? Turn to your neighbor and say, what do you want? All right, number two, here we go. He said, what shall, I, what shall I do for you? Tell me. And then there's a quick question. What do you have in your house? So he starts off by saying, what do you want? And now he said, this is what I want. I want all this big stuff. God, I want this. And he says, all right, great, great. So what do you got right now? What do you have right now? And the woman said, I ain't got nothing except. A little jar of oil. A little jar of oil is more than enough. I'm going to say it again. A little jar of oil is more than enough. The Lord spoke to me back 1999. Corona, California. I was driving through my city telling God what I wanted. I said, oh God, I want to harvest in my city. Oh, God. I said, God, show me how to reach this city. And he spoke to me. And he said, son, come up with a plan. Whatever it is, I'll bless it. Now, I had a handful of people. We had maybe 40 people in our church. And I wanted to reach a city. We started going out. Two or three. Go out on the streets, out by the schools, and started witnessing. All of a sudden, the first day we went out, 10 young people gave their life to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And more, then more, then more, then more. Yeah. Within one year, over 1,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Come on, y'all hearing me. Yeah. The, the, the largest church in the city, their youth group doubled in size in about a four-month period. And they, they did not understand it. Because, see, the Lord spoke to me. He said, he said, I want to use you, but you won't get the credit. <laughs> and their youth group doubled in size from about 200 to over 400. It, it was huge. And they said, they said they had a phenomenon going on. 
They called it spontaneous water baptisms. They said, we don't understand it, but young people keep walking in the door and asking, hi, I'm here for the first, can I get water baptized? They said, we weren't talking about it. We weren't teaching it. It was, it was a miracle move of God. Well, not really. It was a move of God because when we got them saved on the street, we said, hey, go find a church and get water baptized. <laughs> but it didn't matter that we didn't get the credit. Come on, somebody, Amen. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that, that we did. So I wasn't, I, when I wanted to reach the city, I wasn't looking at what I didn't have. I was looking at what I had. I had two or three on fire young evangelists that wanted to go see God do something. And I said, hey, I got a little cruise of oil. This is good enough. See, I find that so many people spend so much of their life sitting back doing nothing because they keep waiting for it to arrive first before they get out. They don't realize, well, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. Do you have something? What do you have? Come on. Do you have a cruise of oil? Do you have a prayer? What do you have? Someone say, what do I have? Uh, what do you have? People get saved and serve God. They say, well, I can't go out and witness. I can't minister to people. I don't have a, a, a theological degree. I don't know all. I can't answer all these questions. Can, can, you, can you pray a prayer for someone to get saved? Can you tell them Jesus loves them? Can you lead them into the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Whatever it is, what do you have? It doesn't matter. Stop worrying about what you don't have and just look at what you have because what you have in the hands of God will do amazing things. David didn't need Saul's armor, and David didn't need some, some big ballistic weapon. He didn't, come on, he didn't need an assault rifle. All he needed was five little stones. He really only needed one. He had the extra four for Goliath's four extra brothers. What do you have? I got a song in my heart, then sing it. What, oh, someone's, <laughs> shh. What do you have? Let me move on. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Number three. And he said, he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. <laughs> from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Number three. Once you see what you have, expand your vision. Everybody say, expand my vision you got to start believing God for something so much more. We are the greatest limitation to God moving in our lives and in our cities. Because our expectations are so low. I'm going to say that again. I have, we are the greatest limitation to the work of God through us, in our region, in our city, in our lives, because we have set our expectations so low. And often we set our expectations so low because of how truly on the inside we view ourselves. The enemy has spent a lifetime trying to limit the way you view yourself. He used parents who said wrong words. He used teachers who spoke negatively. He used peers in your school. He used society to constantly put a limitation in your mind of how you view yourself, how, you, the, how worthy you feel, how righteous you feel, how capable you feel. And so deep on the inside, in a very subconscious level, in the core beliefs of the inside of you, there's a, there's a wall and a limitation that I can't do great things. In fact, there's even those that teach in the body of Christ that if you aspire to do great things, it's pride and it's the devil. But these limitations are not limitations on you. They're limitations that you have placed on God. And so often, we don't go out expecting what we call around here BHAGs. You know what a BHAG is? A big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. <laughs> Believe God for something so far beyond anything we've ever experienced before. Believe God for something greater. Believe God and go out there. Well, what if I fail? Well, at least you, shot, you gave it a shot. It's better not trying. Amen. And you know what? Just keep going because you're going to get it. Come on, just keep going because you're going to get it. You might not get it in the time frame you think you're going to get it, but you can get it. 
Come on. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He's God. He's not a liar. Come on. Come on. He's not the son of man that he should lie. Hath God not said it? Will he not do it? But we've got to allow God to begin to stretch our minds and stretch our imaginations and stretch the, the, the realm of our thinking and our believing. We have limited God. I was in prayer several years ago in my home and I had a vision and I saw into heaven and I saw these massive mounds of treasures and I mean all kinds of treasures. I saw natural wealth, you know, and cars and houses and land and money. I saw arms and legs and, 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 and like, you know, new eyeballs and hearts and I saw anointings and breakthroughs and authority. I saw favor. I saw all of these riches. And there were piles of heaven. And I, and it was, it's, I mean, it was a huge, 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 gigantic room that you really couldn't even see the walls of. And as far as the eye could see, I saw all of these wealth and these, all of these riches. And I said, Lord, what is that? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, those are unclaimed treasures. He said, these are things that I have meant to be released on the earth, but my people have failed to believe for them. And then he said this to me. He said, I need a people today that will all not only get what they were supposed to get, but will have faith and pull these unclaimed treasures into the earth. I don't know if any of you want to be a treasure hunter in heaven right now. Come on, there's some unclaimed, there's not some, there's a mass of unclaimed treasures. And there's a lot of people who have not been exercising their faith and pulling it down. Well, God's just looking for, to you, somebody. He's looking for somebody that'll take the limits off of him and say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to tap into it. And I'm going to call it in. And I'm going to believe for it. And I'm not going to stop until we get it. Not for myself, but that your work can be done in the earth. Your kingdom come and your will be. Huh? Huh? In a right spirit, some of you just need to start crying out, money cometh. Huh? Well, wait, 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 wait. See, some of us are so fearful that some of us, my son Benjamin had a dream about this the other night. Some of us are so fearful about, well, I, if I get all that, you know, I don't want to be polluted by it and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, do wrong things and I don't want to be carnal and I don't want to be fleshy. Why don't you trust God to keep your heart? Huh? Come on. Don't you? What would you really do? What would most of you really do if you had unlimited resources? How much good would you do? How much blessing would you bring? Most of you wouldn't want to just go squandered on yourself. And can't you just say, oh, God, trust me with it and keep my heart, but let it flow because there's a people and a world that needs it. Get up there. Oh, I don't know if I want to go up there and pray for the sick because I don't want people to look at me. Get off of yourself. You think that's humility? That's not humility. That's a false humility. That's a form of pride. Stop worrying about it. God knows how to keep your heart. If you run to him, if you come to him, he knows how to keep you humble. But he needs somebody to stand up and look at sickness and command that thing to go in Jesus' name. He needs somebody to lay hands and cast out some devils. He needs somebody to believe God for something more than what they've got. Shakara mo Sunday. You got to get some vessels. Come on, you got to get some vessels. Vessels to me speak of your vision. It speaks of your expectations. It speaks of the capacity. Oh God, I'm going to grab it, grab it. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to borrow, grab it all my neighbors. I'm going to get everything I can. And then, fourthly, he said, you got to go shut the door. When you get him, Go shut the door and shut the window. You know why? Because if you're going to do crazy things for God, you're going to have to learn how to deal with the negative forces of doubt and unbelief. You're going to have to learn how to turn a deaf ear to all the naysayers. Well, I know someone that tried that and they just went bankrupt. It was terrible. Oh, I know somebody did that. Why? Well, it's just not going to work. You know, it's just not that day and age. You know, you got to, you, know, you know, look what that, oh, Congress is all messed up and you know that Obama, you know. And, um... <laughs> Come on, amen. How you doing, dude? Cool. I like your hair right there. <laughs> He's just going up to the devil saying, you see this? 
It's a shark fin. I'm about to tear you up. I don't even have enough hair left to stand up like that. I only got this much because I took bishops. Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm sorry we're in church. We're not allowed to have fun. <sighs> Come on. You got to shut the door. You're going you're gonna to have to learn how to deal with the negative forces of doubt and unbelief and say, you know what? I ain't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to listen. I love you. Which means you, you need to learn who to share your vision with. You can't. Don't go on Facebook. I'm believing God for this. So. I don't think you ever did it. I didn't know you. You have 43 comments. And the Christians all tell you, well, I'm just telling you this in love. <laughs> no, they ain't. You know, Kenneth Copeland tells a story about Jerry Savelle. How many ever heard of the man of God, Jerry Savelle? You know, man of God? When Jerry Savelle and his wife, they walked into Kenneth Copeland's office years ago, walked into his office and said, God spoke to us, quit our job and go full-time ministry. And Kenneth was like going, because he's watched people do that and just fall flat. And he says, I had no witness in my heart. I had, I had, but I had nothing. I didn't hear from God. He said, but you know what? I wasn't going to rob their faith. And all I said to him is, if you believe God spoke you to do it, then do it. Come on, amen? Because he trusted something like this. If it was God, it was going to work out. And if it wasn't God, they're going to have to get it out of their system anyways. Huh? But I would rather err on the side and just create me. You know what? If you really know that you're, unless I've heard from God otherwise, I'll tell him as a, as a pastor, I'll share with you. Hey, I think that you're making a mistake. But I don't want to quench people's faith. I don't want to talk them out of it. I want them to step out and believe God. And you know what? God might just show up. You remember the story about Joshua when he was in battle and Joshua commanded the sun to stop? God never told him to pray that prayer. Did you notice that? God never told him. God didn't come down and say, now I give the authority to stop the sun. The Bible says never before had God heeded the voice of a man. Josh was like, I need some more sunlight. Stop. <laughs> this is a big prayer. The whole universe went, Aah! And you're worried about getting a couple hundred bucks? <laughs> Talk about taking the limitations off of God. <laughs> Come on, amen. It's time we just, but you're going to have to learn to shut the negative. And I'm telling you, you're going to have all kinds of people around you tell you how you can't do it. And you can't believe God for that. I mean, when we started this church, you know, three and a half years ago, they said, they said oh, you can't do a church like that. You know, you got to go seeker sensitive. You know, everybody's got to have, you know, keep the worship down to 15 minutes and don't make anybody do anything. Have their little lattes and have your little nice sermonette for the Christianettes. Get them in, get them out. 45, 55 minutes, bam, conveyor line. Don't lay hands on people. Don't have the Holy Ghost fall. Don't sit there and have deep, deep, long worship, you know, because people get bored and you just got to know the culture of the day. I just said, I'm not going to listen to the negative forces of doubt and unbelief. I'm grateful for what God has done, but you think this is it? You think I'm, wait, what are you, crazy? We've already got our plans. we got our eyes on some serious land, and well, I want to see a large church. I'm not interested in, uh, listen, I'm not interested in being a mega church just to be a mega church. I want to have a large church full of Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, crazy people for God that are so radical for God, going all over the world, doing missions work. Hallelujah. I want to see so many gifts rise up inside of this church, so many powerful anointings that, that we don't even have enough services to let them be released because God is doing so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Don't tell me no. <laughs> we're going to reach a generation. I said we're going to reach a generation. 
I tell you, from this house, new songs are already rising up. What a powerful, powerful song they introduced last week. What new songs are rising up. The sound's going to go out from here. We're not looking at, listen, I could care less. I've been in the nation of the world. I've been on the biggest platforms with the biggest egos. I mean, uh, men of God. <laughs> Both are true. Uh, I've been, I've, I've been all over the world. I've done the big crowds and all that stuff. Who cares about all that? We're not talking about all that. And I'm not worried. I said, oh, Lord, what about my heart? When he told me. He said, you just stay close to me. I'll take care of your heart. But, I, but it's looking. He's looking for you. Believe me, in the dream. What do you want to do? I want you to reach this generation. What do you want? Well, I started. I'm making, I'm making my list, and it ain't small. Oh, my Lord. Shakara, my Sunday. Don't mind me if I talk in tongues. I ain't talking to you. <laughs> Bible says, he who prays in an unknown tongue, prays not unto men, he prays unto God, for he utters mysteries with the Spirit. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So shut the doors. Deal with the negative forces of doubt and unbelief. Keep that small circle of prayer warriors and people of faith and people that encourage you and people that speak life. You don't have to share with your relatives, please. You don't have to (laughs) share. Huh? But the Bible talks about write the vision, make it plain, you know, write it down, get a hold of it, get the limits off and go do it. And your Belie- the dimension of the gathering of the vessels and expansion of the vision and your ability to keep out the negative forces of doubt and unbelief are so key to the fulfillment of the destiny of God in your life. Then she started pouring the oil. Because here's the fifth thing. You got to let go what you got. Now that's a sticking point. But I only got this little... I gotta guard it. Gotta protect it. But think about it with me for a moment. Think about throughout all of biblical history, throughout all the great stories, think about what they had to release in every area. The little widow, she had to release the oil. Peter, when he got out of the boat, he had to release his fear. Hmm? When Jesus turned to the man, stretch forth thy hand, he had to release his idea of his limitations. He had to release something because the key to increase is release. I'm going to say that again. The key to increase is release. The Bible says, put on the garment of praise. Release some praise for the spirit of heaviness. Go on, you want to get free of heaviness? You got to release a praise. Don't sit there and walk around and don't, and please don't hang out with the, with the crowd of the depressed. Come on, come on. Don't, don't hang out with God's frozen chosen. They'll kill you. Get around some praisers. Get around some crazy praisers. Get around some people that make you uncomfortable because they praise so much. Huh? I mean, come on, we got, we got some sisters in here saying, hey, Jesus, get around some people like that. It'll rub off on you. You might be conservative white folk, but get around some of those sisters. They'll be going, Jesus, and you'll be just like, yo, just get close, you'll feel it. It'll get on you. <laughs> Ooh, glory, glory, glory. You got to release what you got. Someone say, I got to release what I got. Say it again. Say, I got to release what I got. You got to release what you got. God gave you a word of encouragement. The Bible says, then release some encouragement. Huh? I was a little stirred up today because of some circumstances. So I went, <laughs> so I'm in the gym and I'm, I'm praying this prayer. Oh God, give me power. Give me, give me a new level of anointing and authority to deliver a generation of young people from, addi- from drugs and from addiction. And so then I go in, and I'm like, I'm kind of broken up and over in this prayer. And I go into the sauna, and there's three high school students there. And they got their, their iPod out playing, and they're playing some rap music. And I said, and I said, <laughs> So I'm starting listening to the words, and I can't hardly understand them because I'm over 40. 
And I started listening to the words, and I can't quite hear the words. And then the one kid said, oh, man, I like this song. And the other kid said, yeah, I like this line when he says, he, instead of saying, I go to high school, he says, I go to school high. And I jumped out right then, and I said, and it'll destroy your life. And then I took about 15 minutes and I talked to him about my personal experiences with drugs and, 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 and the battles we've dealt with, people that we've loved and been around, and how it destroys and what it happens and what goes on. And they're sitting there like, oh, like, oh. I mean, and I sit there and I said, I said, and you have no idea the pain it'll cause your parents. I said, you love your parents? Yes, yeah, sir. And I said, don't you ever hurt your, you may think it's fun now, but it's, I said, it's spiritual. I said, you believe in the spirit world? Yes, sir. I said, it opens the door for demons to come in. You ain't having just a little fun. You're opening so that and it'll destroy your life. And they were just like, they came up to me. Thank you for talking to us, man. All right. <laughs> I said, devil, I'm tired of you messing with people I care about. I'm tired of you messing with people in my church. I'm tired of you messing with people in my city. And I'm going to take you on head on. I'm not worried about being nicey-nicey. We're going to take you on and we're going to drive you out. I'm going to take whatever I got and I'm going to release it. That's why some of you need to go down to Walmart after church and just find somebody and say, can I pray for you right now? And you'll see miracles, you'll see miracles. And as long as you keep releasing what you got, the oil will keep flowing, the oil will keep flowing. But it's when we settle down in the pews and settle down in our church and settle down in our comfort zone that it all stops. Someone say, I don't want to stop. Shoo, they continue a flow. But it all begins this incredible miracle. They got so much, they paid off all the debt. And they lived for years off the abundance of one afternoon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But it all began with a crisis. It all began with a crisis. In the midst of that crisis, God turned them. I said, what do you want? What do you got? Go gather some vessels. Expand your vision. Get the limits off. You got to shut out the negative forces of doubt and unbelief. And then you got to take what you got and you just got to keep releasing, keep releasing, keep releasing. Keep, as long as you keep releasing, it will keep flowing. And at some point, it's going to become an abundance. You say, oh, Brother Steve, it seems like it's taking years. Keep releasing. Don't stop. There's so much. We got America's in trouble. The church is in trouble. But the great revivals that have swept the world didn't begin with a million people. They began with a few. Two, three, four, five. That broke through the limitations. That cried out in desperation. And got a hold of God. And God said, I finally found some vessels that have taken the cap off. And that are going to pour. They pour out their lives. They're going to pour out what they have. I can use them. Amen. Lift your hands for a moment. Say, Father, use me. I'm going to take the limits off. Go ahead and pray. If you have the Holy Ghost, prayer language, Holy Spirit, pray in the Spirit. Otherwise, just talk to Him for a few moments. Father Jesus, Father, Father, I know there's many people Father, I know there's many people here that are going through many circumstances and, and the strategy of the enemy in, in hitting us is to get our eyes on ourselves, but we're not going to get our eyes on ourselves, God. We're going to get our eyes on you. We're not going to get our eyes on our limitations, but we're going to get our eyes on your unlimitedness. That's what we're going to believe for, God. <laughs> That's what we're going to expect, God. Oh, Lord Jesus. Boy, his presence is here right now.